so this is this is largely the work put to, the idea put together by by david david bernhold i'm just uh, using his slides to give a talk and get all the glory okay so uh for the summary what we have decided to do is bring to your attention a particular focus on software that was part of a lot of news um, um, and that generated a lot of interest at least in the software engineering community and brought sharp focus on software practices in the scientific world and hence the title software under the microscope so the story goes as follows that when covid hit uh the policy makers needed to make decisions about uh uh, the spread and the mitigation and risk, uh, I mean, um, risk mitigation for, uh, for, for spread of COVID. And so they asked the epidemiologists to model the spread of COVID based upon certain parameters. And so one researcher from Imperial College, Neil Ferguson, ran his models and briefed the, and this is, um, so this is in UK, and he briefed the UK Parliament on the model that he had, um, the, the, the model that he had computed. And uh, basically, they guided the policy that the government was making in terms of uh, lockdowns in place, um, the restrictions on movements, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, even though the government's, uh, these models exist, they do rely on a lot of assumptions. Uh, and they have so the, the picture here shows you the kind of uh, scenarios that they would put in in terms of what happens if it is it has this much degree of communicability what happens if it has this much degree of communicability etc cetera, etc cetera, how much population is going to be affected um and so on and so forth so this is a model that they ran uh and then it came into uh, uh attention because uh very soon after this uh, model was uh, used to brief the UK Parliament, an independent climate science researcher uh, wrote a blog article stating that he couldn't see where some of the assumptions came from. Moreover, he went on to assert that the code is old, unverified, and documented inadequately, if at all. And that created a storm of uh, back and forth among communities of uh, commercial software development and the scientific establishment and so on and so forth. Uh, so also, and this is where the, uh, the real spotlight happened is that the press picked up the story. And so all of these epithets uh, or the, the uh, things that were bandied about like the results, scientists from University of Edinburgh tried to run the model and reproduce the results, but said that it was impossible to re reproduce the results and that they uh, found a bug and then they, they claimed that it was first of many bugs that was found within the program. Uh, and then the commercial software world chimed in making statements like we would fire anyone for developing a code like this. Uh, and uh, the and models must be capable of passing the basic scientific and, and basically if someone in the commercial world did uh, their work in the way that this model was developed that they would be fired etc cetera, etc cetera. the next step was that uh, yet another person rebutted the criticisms of the imperial code and that spurred further discussions but the many the first thing that he pointed out was that the software the commercial software world does not deal with the complexity of the codes in many ways that scientific codes do and what they consider more important in terms of verification is uh, the scientific validity and good scientific practice and that they may be, they don't care so much about uh, writing this the the stylist the style of the code the stylistically um how the code appears to the world, but that they spend a great deal of time in making sure that the code is scientifically correct. And then one more thing that then was never picked up by the press again was that the code check did an independent uh, 
check of the model and was able to reproduce results of Imperial uh, College's uh, Imperial's report. Okay, so what did this bring about? This brings some observations to mind. Uh, one of them is that the code is likely to live longer than you expect and may be used in ways that you don't expect by people. And so you have to plan for it. Um, the other thing that comes out from this spotlight is that it is no longer possible for computational science to keep going under the radar of public scrutiny because more and more um, consequential decisions are based upon computational models. And therefore, the codes that are generating these models that are actually making influencing the policy decisions are going to be subject to greater scrutiny. And um, if you don't, if you cannot back up your claims with some kind of reproducibility of results and robustness of your software and the quality of your software, um, there is not going to be enough of credibility of the results that you obtain that they will be questionable. And so the good software engineering practices such that documentation, testing, verification, where possible validation are critical for credibility of science done with software. Uh, and that also applies to code readability and other quality metrics, because this brings us to the question is that should we excuse scientific software for being crappy stylistically as the defender of the Imperial Code had said. Now, um, the point that is to take away from there is that yes, in that case, it turned out that the, style, uh, the crappy style didn't uh, detract from the efficacy of the code, but that's usually not true because if you have a, a code that is written badly, chances are that it is hiding bugs somewhere that you cannot see. So uh, just like with anything else, simple cleaner and easy to verify things are much better to be confident about than otherwise. Um, goes back to the thing that we have stated over and over in this uh, tutorial is that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So this is, if you don't take away anything else from this tutorial, I be hope that you take away this key thought that um, you cannot do good science if you don't have good software practices and good software uh, verification regime in place. So to summarize, we covered many topics today. We, we covered topic of project management. We covered the topic of collaboration around software development how to do design, how to soft design software for flexibility and extensibility, uh, various testing strategies for complex software systems, uh, refactoring of large complex software systems, continuous integration testing and reproducibility. That doesn't mean that we covered everything. We were by no means comprehensive in terms of the topics that one must pay attention to in, um, in a good software project. And these topics included things like documentation, licensing, packaging, distribution, issue tracking, and all of those that are listed on the left side of this slide. Now, the reason is, is uh, our choice is not entirely arbitrary. Uh, one thing that is, is that there is only so much we can cover in a day. And to cover everything without going into depth of anything is actually not useful to anyone. So we made this choice upfront to focus on a few topics and do a more in-depth presentation um, related to those topics. But even, among, even after that decision, um, the topics that we pick is not arbitrary. The topics that we have picked are uh, the ones for which, so the topics that are listed on the left side, many of them have, uh, because they have less distinction between your general uh, enterprise software and research software, it is much easier to find other tutorials and literature that you can use to self-teach yourself on these topics. But the topics that we have chosen to cover are the ones where commercial software, um, is uh, practices and literature is helpful 
but not enough in the sense that many of those practices need certain amount of customization that are specific to the research software and scientific software world that the uh, commercial software don't need and therefore they don't get as much uh, um, exposure in the uh, literature related to enterprise software. And also these are still the topics at which our community is coming to terms with. And so uh, these are the immediate next level concerns for starting researchers. And here we are trying to have a culture change in terms of making these part of the DNA of all scientific software development processes. So we focus on things that have the highest impact on largest number of people. Uh, so this is a question that usually very often comes up, but you are a researcher, you can't afford to spend all of your time on software engineering. And the answer is we do not recommend that you spend, that you incorporate all of the software engineering practices. One of the running theme of all of our tutorials is that you are the best judge of how much is just enough. When is it too much and when is it too little? And so you should have just enough software engineering so that you can make, make your short term and longer term scientific goals. But keep in mind that there is this curve that was also mentioned earlier is that anytime you do a quick and dirty, you acquire technical debt that then compounds and that then you have to pay for. So sometimes an upfront more higher investment in software engineering process is ultimately going to be resulting in a more efficient outcome for you down the line. So you, um, the way to go about doing this is identify the pain points of your software development process, set a goal for something that you want to improve, agree on a plan to address it, um, identify markers of progress, what is done, work your plan, track your progress, when you're done, celebrate, and then pick up a new pain point to address. Uh, so that is something that uh, is, um, Ideas Project is promoting, and that is productivity and sustainability improvement planning. And that's, that's one way to get started with improving your software process. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the presentations part of this tutorial. We still have uh, an, another round of hands-on for which we will be around. Um, and um, actually, uh, we would be greatly appreciate if you email comments and questions. We do promise to provide full uh, feedback on pull requests in the hands-on repository. Um, and these are all the resources that are available for you to uh, further keep connected with us. And like we said earlier, we are always looking for more contributors. So if you are motivated by the uh, work we have presented here, ideas that we have presented here, and you want to be more deeply engaged with us, we welcome, we would welcome that. Uh, you know where to reach us.